Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to talk to you about a business that's really close to my heart. Um, I'm actually from the family, um, and today I'll be presenting a little bit about our journey in BP De Silva over the many generations. So to start it off, I'd like to bring you all back to where it all began in Gaul, Sri Lanka, which is a southern port in Sri Lanka uh, in the 1860s. Uh, my great-great-grandfather left uh, this port town uh, at the age of 18 with a pocket full of gems and, I guess, some dreams. And he basically traveled around Southeast Asia on a ship for about two years. And he was, I guess he was trying to up, suss out at that time what would be the best town to begin this journey of his uh, business. And he chose Singapore uh, in, the early, uh, in the 1980s. Um, he started um, with um, Singapore. He chose Singapore as the, the point at where he, he would start his business. And quite interestingly, he chose this street, uh, which is actually High Street. Uh, if you look at the building on the right, that's the cricket club. And the building in front there is the, the prestigious hotel at that, in that uh, era, which was called Hotel Europa. So to the left of this image, which we don't have, is actually the Singapore River. So customers would actually get off and actually go to the Hotel Europa, and he nestled his shop on that street so he could get the right type of clientele. And it started off as a jewelry shop. So this is an image of him. Um, he basically built up uh, a jewelry business, and since then it's really diversified into a, a multiple businesses, and it's actually quite challenging for me and my siblings to get a grip of it because we are, we're quite widely um, diversified. We're in about eight industries today, but it started in this shop. So, like I was mentioning, it started in 1872. It started as a jewelry shop, and then I guess him being very entrepreneurial, he, he thought, okay, jewelry is for women, what could I give the men? So then the Swiss, Swiss watch uh, distribution came in the 1920s. So then we started to expand regionally. So we had a shop in Ipoh, we had a shop in Penang, we had a shop in KL, we had a shop in Sri Lanka. And then, of course, you know, uh, as Chinese saying goes, you know, the third generation is always a bit iffy. So there's problems in the third generation, actually. The fourth generation uh, consolidated the business. And I guess that's where my dad comes in uh, in the 1990s. And he really diversified the business quite a lot. Uh, and now, now me and my brother and my sister are here to try and sort of make sense of this and really focus um, this business. So if you just look at uh, this ownership chart, so the circles on the left indicate the number of shareholders. So you can see it started off with one shareholder. That's Mr. BP De Silva himself. Now, in the second generation, he had five children. He had four daughters and one son. And basically, at that time, uh, daughters were sort of didn't get involved in the business. You know, it was all arranged marriages at that time. I was talking to my grandmother, and she told me that 98% of marriages were arranged by the parents at that time. So he, he, he got them uh, married, uh, one daughter to a politician, one daughter to an accountant, one daughter to a lawyer, and one to an engineer. So my brother always jokes that, you know, he, he kind of, in a way, got his board of directors settled. <laughs> Um, and then uh, he had one son, so the pressure was on the son to manage the business, but uh, my great-great-grandfather realized that this guy was kind of like a playboy, so he banished him from the business. Gave him shares, but he was not allowed to work in the business. And the early part of the century, he actually gave management shares, which was quite um, unique, I think, at that time. And he gave it to his three best managers, and that's how you get the eight shareholders. Uh, in the second generation, and he actually made the youngest manager to be in charge of the business. By the third generation, like I mentioned, there were different countries, uh, and each family got to operate each country, and squabbles started to arise, and basically, uh, some families said, okay, this is not 
as good as this country or this part is not good as this part and family squabble started and my grandfather realized at that point that if no one was going to control this company, it was going to break apart. Um, and in that generation, he, actually, he was actually a medical doctor. And at the age of, I think, 43 or 45, he actually went to National University of Singapore to study business and kind of retrain himself to understand the business world. Took a big loan from, from a bank over a handshake that my father still reminds me today with HSBC. And they lent us quite a big sum of money to actually consolidate the shares. So the families that were not so interested in the business or wanted to get out, there was an exit mechanism for them. And my father has further consolidated the business since and diversified it as well. Okay. So I think one thing my dad has always um, sort of uh, told us as we were growing up was that when he took on the loan, he needed to find the best way to pay back the loan. And he really needed to focus on the business that made the most money at that time, which was actually the watch business for our family. Uh, but what he told us in our generation, um, it's very important that it's time for us to really take this leap and really develop our own brands that we can take to the world. So even though brands, because we have the experience in distribution, they have come to us, uh, we have turned them down and really stood firm that we want to build these brands. So... And I think what's interesting in our generation, and I think we're really, really fortunate uh, to be in this position, and we need to stand for something more than just in what I co consider capital extraction, which is really profit and loss and looking to make the most money. I think my brother, my sister, and myself are, are really, uh, believe very strongly that we want to build the best brands for the world. Not the best brands in the world, but for the world. So always looking at how to consider more than just the capital aspect of building a brand. And for us, I guess uh, we really want to push ourselves to be less calculative, like I mentioned. And I think from a business reason, we actually get to attract the right type of talent. That's not just after money. Uh, and I'm looking for the bigger picture and what we're trying to do. Um, and we're, we operate... Uh, so this is, the, this is the gamut of brands um, that we have today in the group. Uh, my sister has this phrase about my father, and uh, she calls him the roti brata octopus because he has all his tentacles juggling all these different businesses. And to be honest, it's a real, real challenge because it's so diversified. Uh, you know, we have gold plating, we have tea, we have restaurants, uh, we have watches, um, engineering, power. So it's very, very diverse. So. Us coming into the business, how do we make sense of this? So this was uh, developed by my brother. So by and large, uh, we separated into operations and investments. So operations is where the family gets directly involved in. Uh, so the jewelry and the tea pieces are where we're directly day-to-day -day involved in. Uh, the foundation is something that we started last year, and my parents are involved with that. Investments, we separated into active and passive. So active would be where we have a board seat uh, and we go for attend board meetings and passive are just investments. So some of the active investments, so we have Senso. I'm sure some of y'all might have eaten in Senso, Spizza, Lanona. So quite a, quite a nice Italian uh, set of options. Uh, MV Pure, we do wastewater treatment, air purification, Xyrex, hydropower in Sri Lanka. Audemars uh, Piguet, we invested. So my dad realized as a, dist as a distributor, um, there was always the risk that the brand would take, back, uh, would take back the distribution. And when he got the opportunity to invest in Audemars Piguet in the 90s, he took the, took the opportunity. And um, yeah, it's one of the last family-owned watch brands. Uh, GIC, Gem Testing Laboratory in Sri Lanka. So and some of the passive investments, the ones uh, in brackets are the ones that we are currently looking at that we want to develop uh, more knowledge and exposure into these areas. A uh, little bit about the foundation. So what happens in the group is all the profits that are made in all these companies, uh, we take 10% of that and we funnel it to the foundation and the foundation uh, starts to allocate it into various uh, sort of objectives. And uh, we're still a work in progress, but that's the structure um, that the foundation operates on. 
Okay, so this is my baby. Uh, I don't know how many of y'all have seen this. I'm also going to do this. How many of y'all have seen this brand before? Oh, wow. Okay. I'm so happy. <laughs> okay, so this is, this is actually where I spend most of my time, and this is my baby. So um, basically in Clipper, we're really trying to sort of elevate tea um, and try to make it a real experience that uh, people would like to learn more about tea because I feel like coffee has been given a lot of limelight and actually there's so much in the world of tea that I want to share with everyone. So this is actually our conduit to do that. So uh, right now we have 10 point of sales in Singapore. So we opened a flagship in Ion uh, and opened a boutique in Raffle City. And maybe about a month ago, we are also available in T2 and T3 uh, in the airports through Discover Singapore. Uh, so basically, it's like a wholesale model. So we do also sell to cafes, restaurants, hotels um, on the back of the retail presence. So as people see the brand more, more customers ask for it in cafes and stuff. And that's how the model works. It's part of a vertically integrated group. So we actually have a factory and plantations in Sri Lanka. So we're totally vertically integrated. So we really, what, we really know what goes into your team. And for me, personally, uh, my long-term goal in the tea business is to see how I can improve the lives of the pluckers. So at the end of my life, if, you know, if I had the world's biggest tea company, that wouldn't satisfy me. For me, what would satisfy me is if I had known that I had changed the lives of the people that pluck the tea, because I, I always think that they are the, the ones who are forgotten. So that's my long-term goal. So a little bit about how the business model has transformed. So... Back in the day, I guess we were just selling to cafes and restaurants, and we did a bit of private label with the Raffles Hotel. But today, we have looked at different parts of the distribution and looking at how to push different parts of it to expand the business. So we really focus on the B2C part uh, to get the brand visibility, and I'm so glad that so many of you all know the brand. Um, uh, in the B2B, we used to do our own distribution, but we've got a distributor now. E-commerce is something that only accounts for less than 1% of the turnover now, but I, I'm really looking at ways to see how we can increase that because I really want to create um, a more e-commerce model for the business. Um, we started to export into Southeast Asian countries and we've also introduced the F&B component, which is completely different uh, from the retail business. And uh, it's something that's very new and fresh uh, to the business. There's a tea bar in ION, so if y'all are in ION, go check it out, and the private label. So a little bit about product innovation. So uh, this is the part I get very involved in and I'm very excited about. So the image on the left is actually tea puffs. Um, so I actually paired up uh, with uh, a pastry, uh, pastry chef from Doucet Studio. Uh, Japanese pastry chef to create these tea puffs and what they are are actually uh, tea puffs uh, with cream which is infused with tea so all of them have tea flavors and why I did this was because a lot of people may not be into tea so they're like I only drink coffee but because there's something which is a food uh, medium they might be open to try that tea puff and when they try that tea puff they'll be like hey oh so that's all gray oh, okay so that's sort of a conduit which I sort of open people up who are not into tea, into the world of tea. The second, uh, the second one is a very cool machine that, I, that is in all my shops. So the two factors that affect tea uh, are actually the brewing time and the brewing temperature of the water. And uh, I don't know if you all can see in the middle, there's a little iPad on the, on the table and all my teas um, have their, each their own recipes where these two factors are taken into consideration. And for once in a tea shop, consumer can taste any tea he wants. Because normally there's only a little part that's on display, but now we can sample any of the teas in the shops. And the last one is actually the cold brew tea, which is actually something that I saw in the States that was happening for coffee. And I thought, hey, why don't we try and do it for tea? And I actually partnered with Island Creamery, who's actually a ice cream business, but uh, we collaborate closely and we created this cold brew nitro tea. And really the innovation um, and R&D efforts are really, uh, it's kind of led by 
the marketing team. So whenever the marketing team feedbacks to me what they see in the market, I kind of work together with them and engage different partners to develop uh, these concepts. So a little bit about the store design inspiration. So back then when I came back from school, there was only the product. There was no store at all. So um, I had very little to work with and I wanted to keep it consistent. So I had the logo, I had the product. So basically what could I draw from these two images? And I, I realized it was uh, a few things stood out. One was the blue. Uh, I thought that was pretty distinctive. Um, I also thought that the nautical element was quite distinctive as well. There was a ship. Uh, I did think that the, the border as well was pretty distinctive. And I took those, took what I thought was distinctive and developed it into store design. So if you look at uh, this image, uh, you can see that the blue actually frames um, frames the, the shop. Um, and then I guess um, in the middle, you can see the white that comes through that clean look. Um, again, uh, if you look at a waist and below the waist, you can see that I've used wood and in certain elements, you can, s you can notice the curves. So it's subtly giving that imagery of a ship. And if you look at that center table as well, you can look, you can see the brass elements that kind of give the, the sense of a hull. So I've kind of tried to bring those elements into the store design as well. And I guess with the floor, I really wanted to create that idea of sky. Um, and that's why I've used uh, gray. And I think um, I'd like to say that we're, you know, we're, we're not we're not perfect, and I think it's a long journey, and um, you know, we're, we're always open to criticisms and feedback, and um, yeah, I think it's a long journey. Design is a long journey. Building a business is a long journey, and um, yep, that's about it. I'd like to wrap up. Thank you.